and active, sharper than a two-edged sword in our hearts today. Lord, we ask that you will create such an insatiable desire for your presence and for revival that we can help but cry out until you come. God, we're asking you to birth something in us today. Holy Spirit, we are, we are asking you to hover over us today and make us so we cannot quit pressing in until we're satisfied with the with a magnified sense of your presence over this church and over this city and over this state and over this nation. Lord, we need something that we cannot do for ourselves. We need you to manifest in ways that we're unaccustomed to. We need to manifest in a way to where we're shaken through and through to where we can't rest being lukewarm anymore. Holy Spirit, we cry out for you today in Jesus' name. Amen. What the world needs now, it's something more than love, sweet love. I preached Acts 2, 1 to 13 on Pentecost Sunday. And the wonder of a waiting ecclesia who waited and prayed as instructed by Jesus until Pentecost occurred and the Holy Spirit was poured out upon them. There was an immediate change that occurred in those who followed Jesus from that time forward. The secret of their transition is they continued to do as Jesus instructed after the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Number one, Peter's transformation from denier to proclaimer. Today we will begin and we'll only get a start at looking at Peter's first sermon after having been a lily-livered, chicken-hearted man who denied Jesus three times before the cock crowed. He was transformed into a bold, spirit-baptized proclaimer of the gospel. Acts 2.14, As the twelve stood together, Peter shouted to the crowd, Someone has to be first to step up and speak out. Now you look at the crowd, there was the rioters, the skeptics, and people with no greater force, focus than having a good time over a holiday weekend. And people like that are easily manipulated to mob behavior. There was great division in the land since the crucifixion and burial of Jesus. People either loved him or hated him. It was similar to the current political ads. Uh, you, you look at them, you either love them or you hate them. There just doesn't seem to be any middle ground. And we need a heavenly focus to discern truth in this hour. And I want to release that. Father, I ask you to release a greater spiritual discernment of what is true and what is false what is good and what is evil, what will bring glory, what will release shambles on our nation. And Lord, let us walk according to that discernment in Jesus' name. The media of Jesus' day was fabricating the news with a specific slant rather than reporting it. Reporters were by and large puppets of twisted religious and governmental leaders. Matthew wrote this about that. He said, after the women left the tomb, a few of the guards went into Jerusalem and told the chief priest everything they had seen and heard. So the chief priest called a meeting with all the religious leaders and came up with a plan. They bribed the guards with a large sum of money and, and told them, tell everyone while we were asleep, his disciples came at night and stole his body. If Pilate finds out about this, don't worry. We'll make sure you don't get blamed. So they took the money and did as they were told. And that is why the story of the guards is still circulated among the Jews to this day. What can be done when everyone is doing what is right in their own eyes and building their platforms on lies and partial truths? Someone must step up and speak out. Bless Simon Peter, he was never lukewarm. He was either all in and ready to die with Jesus or he was all out siding with Satan against Jesus being crucified. He was all in walking on the waves and then all wet sinking in the water. He was all in taking a sword and cutting off the ear of one of the men arresting Jesus and then all out denying he even knew Jesus before the cock crowed. Of course, you've never been that way. You've never been really with Jesus part of the time and not so much the rest of the time. 
but Peter was transformed when he was anointed from on high and baptized in the Holy Spirit. In Acts 2, the Holy Spirit was poured out on the waiting believers and they all spilled into the streets speaking in tongues. The 12 apostles stood together before a crowd that was either all in, having been baptized in the same Holy Spirit, or all out mocking those who were speaking in tongues. Someone had to turn the tide of a mob that was becoming increasingly unruly. Peter, who less than two months earlier denied he knew Jesus, stepped up and spoke under the anointing and unction of the Holy Spirit. And he preached a short but powerful sermon. Nobody had to take a bathroom break or get a drink of water as Peter challenged them to something more life-changing than rioting in the streets. Now, since my sermons tend to be longer than the first 25, or 25 verses of Peter's sermon in Acts 2, 14 to 39, let me point out something to you before going on. Look at Acts 2, 40. With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them. They probably just didn't record all his message. Probably their voice recorders were not working or their cell phones lit up while they were trying to listen. But let's move on to Peter's anointed message that brought great revival to the saved and unsaved. Number two, understanding who is listening. We need to know our audience. Peter, Acts 2, 14b. Men of Judea and all who are staying here in Jerusalem, listen. I want you to understand, these people aren't drunk as you may think. Look, it's only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this isn't drunkenness. This is the fulfillment of the prophecy of Joel. Hear what God says. Peter was preaching to the rabble rousers, not the nice compliant 120. One size does not fit all. I preach different at jail. I go there tomorrow night. I preach different at jail than I do here. I teach different at seminars than I do here. I remember John Maxwell saying, and please don't be offended, but he said, believers need more than sermonettes for Christianettes who are in a hurry to run out to smoke the cigarettes. Paul says meat is for the mature, and since you're mature, I try to bring you the fatted calf. People knew he was talking, or Peter knew he was talking to worldly people who figured those talking in tongues were drunk. They were not familiar with the book of Joel or the promise being fulfilled before their very eyes. People without the Spirit of God are clueless concerning what God is up to. They presume, presume that these anointed tongue-talking Pentecostals were drunk. They clearly understood being drunk with wine, but Paul said that leads to asotia, which means salvation, not. Number three, someone has to understand the times, the kairos, the, the season we're in. Peter, who months earlier resisted God's plan for Jesus to be crucified, suddenly understood what Pentecost is all about. It refers to the pouring out of the Holy Spirit upon people who will submit to Jesus Christ and choose to follow him all the way. Peter understood the times and linked what God was doing to the promise of the outpouring from Joel 2:28 through 32. The power of Pentecost transformed society then, and it has several times in America's history. That is what we need now. And I ask you a question, will you be a part of it? Pam and I listened well, America has a great history of, or a history of great awakenings. Well, Pam and I listened last Sunday afternoon to a wonderful teaching by Robert Heidler. In fact, we were so caught up that most of the stuff on television is garbage. So we went to the web and connected it to the TV, and we watched three sermons Sunday afternoon. But Robert Heidler was pointed out many of the times of awakening in America. In America. Just like the Old Testament, when people become miserable enough, they begin crying out to God for change. And he answers by sending spiritual awakening that changes society from the inside out. And I spent some time on the web concerning great awakenings in America and jotted just a few of them down. God sent awakening to the colonies when the, those 
held captive in a British ship, cried out, British ship cried out to God to save the American flag. We watched that video last week. I was tickled when I saw that, that Becky copied it and sent it to her Facebook friends. Hallelujah. People that were willing to stand and pay the price to win. Great Awakening in America from 1734 to 1743. It actually began in 1724 when Jonathan Edwards sparked revival in his own church, which sparked awakening throughout his, message, his nation. And it came a time when things weren't going well for Edwards. After months of fruitless labor, he reported five or six people converted, one a young woman. He wrote this about her. She had been one of the greatest company keepers in the whole town. Now you can imagine what he meant by company keepers, prostitutes, fornicators. He feared her conversion would douse the flame, but quite the opposite took place. 300 souls were converted in six months in a town of only 1,100 people. The news spread like wildfire and a similar revival broke out in over 100 other towns. Edwards was so nearsighted he had to hold his Bible close to his eyes like this to, to read them. And he held his candle in his other hand. And he was preaching away one night and he heard a noise and he pre looked over his Bible, Bible and everybody in the congregation was slain on the spirit, laying on the floor under the unction of the preaching of the word of God. That's about as clear a definition as we'll ever get. During a spiritual revival, God supernaturally transforms believers and non-believers in a region, locale, region, nation, or the world through a sudden, intense enthusiasm for Christianity. People sense the presence of God powerfully in conviction, despair, contrition, repentance, and prayer comes easily. People thirst for God's word, and many authentic conversions occur and backsliders are renewed. Let me tell you, God did it before. He can do it again. George Whitfield was a British Anglican who came to America and was used to spark revival. The Church of England would not assign him a pulpit. So he began preaching in parts and field in England and on his own reached people who would never attend church. He used every possible means to get the gospel message out. He became one of the founders of, of the Methodist, Methodist evangelical movement. He was criticized by the religious, yet thousands were converted by his passionate preaching and signs and wonders. He came to America in 1739 Whitfield's dramatic preaching was like striking a match to the already underway awakening. An estimated 80% of America's 900,000 colonists personally heard Whitfield preach. God did it before. He can do it again. The second great awakening, James McGreedy and Charles Finney, 1800 to 1840. In 1800, only one in 15 of America's population of 5,300,000 belong to an evangelical church. 2019, United States only one in 20 attend any church on a weekly basis. But Presbyterian minister James McGrady presided over strange spiritual manifestations in Logan County, Kentucky. The resulting camp meeting revivals drew thousands from as far away as Ohio. Reverend Gardner Spring reported that for the next 25 years, not a single month passed without a news of a revival. Oh God, do it again. A revival somewhere in this country. In 1824, Charles Finney began a career that would eventually convert 500,000 to Christ. An unparalleled 100,000 were converted in Rochester, New York. In 1831, causing the revival to spread to 1,500 towns, by 1850, the nation's population exploded fourfold to 23 million people. But those who connected to evangelical churches grew nearly tenfold from 350,000 to 3 million church members. God did it before, he can do it again. The businessman's revival of 1857, 1858, Jeremiah Lanfear. In 1857, 
the Dutch church colony in New York City hired a businessman, not a preacher, a businessman, Jeremiah Lan Lanfear, to be a lay ministry. He prayed, Lord, what would you have me do? I think we need to pray that prayer. It's part of what Pastor Lorraine was sharing early. Will you pray that prayer with me? Lord, what will you have me to do? And as we keep praying that, God will put the seeds of revival in our hearts that will spread to those that we, that we meet with and talk with. Lanfear was concerned by the anxious faces of business women on the street, business men and women on the streets of New York City. So he decided to open the church at noon. That's what God told him to do so businessmen could pray. The first meeting was set for September 23, three weeks before the bank panic of 1857. Six attended the first week, 20 the next, then 40. Then they switched to daily meetings. Before long, all the space was taken and other churches opened up for businessmen's prayer meetings. And revival broke out everywhere in 1857, spreading throughout the United States and the world. Sometimes this is called the Great Prayer Meeting Revival, and an estimated one million people, excuse me, were added to America's church roles, and as many as one million of the four million existing church members were also converted. Hear that. The church members got saved. God did it before he can do it again. The Civil War Revival, 1861 to 1865, the bitter dispute over slavery thrust our nation into the deadliest war we had ever at that time experienced. By the end, 620 Americans, 20,000 Americans lay dead. That's one out of every 50 of the 31 million people counted in the 1860 census. As the start of the Civil War in 1861, it seemed as though the soldiers for both sides had left their Christianity at home and gone morally berserk. Sound familiar? By 1862, the tide turned, first among the Confederate forces, an estimated 300,000 soldiers were converted and evenly divided between the southern and northern ar armies. God did it before, he can do it again. And then the urban revivals of 1875 to 1885, Young businessman Dwight L. Moody participated in the great revival of 1857 as it swept Chicago. Moody, Moody uh, later conducted revivals throughout the British Isles where he spoke to more than 2,500,000 people. In 1875, Moody returned home and began revivals in America's bigger cities. Hundreds and thousands were convict, converted and millions were inspired by the greatest soul winner of his generation. God did it before and God can do it again. The revivals of 1905 and 1906, Billy Sunday, baseball player, baseball star, turned evangelist. Word of the Welch revival spread to the Welch-speaking settlers in, in Pennsylvania in late 1904, and revival broke out, and pretty soon, by 1905, local revivals blazed in places like Brooklyn, New York, Denver, Schenectady, uh, Nebraska, North and South Carolina, and Georgia. And then it moved to the colleges, Taylor University, Yale University, Asbury College in Wilmore, Kentucky. And Billy Sunday became a key figure about the time. He preached to more than a hundred million people with over a million conversations. God did it again. He can did it before he can do it again. My first church was Free Methodist. That was like the Methodist that got saved, got some religion. And we used to go to Winona Lake where the headquarters was for, for um, meetings. And some of the meetings were held in the Billy Sunday Tabernacle. When I first went there, they were still sawdust floors, not, not concrete but sawdust was spread out. And in those sawdust tabernacle, hundreds of people turned to Christ, sought the Holy Spirit and entire sanctification and went home changed, revived, and God did it then, let him do it again now. And then the Azusa Street Revival, 1906, William J. Seymour. 
In 1906, Seymour, an African-American holiness pastor, blind in one eye, went to Los Angeles to candidate for a pastoral job. But after he preached, he was locked out of the second service. Bit discouraging, I imagine. But rather than give up or start a Black Lives Matter riots, he began praying. And he started prayer meetings in a nearby home. And the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which they called the second blessing, fell after months of concerted prayer. Eventually, the interracial crowds became so large they acquired a dilapidated Methodist church at 312 Azusa Street, where daily meetings continued for three years. And the Pentecostal movement, the charismatic movement, traced their roots to th this revival. That's what we need. We don't need Black Lives Matter. We need, we need revival that makes black people and white people and yellow people and red people come together in Christ to get the job of the kingdom done. That's what we need. And God did it before. And God, do it again. Do it again, Lord. And then evangelist Sister Amy Semple McPherson, 1890 to 1944. God used a widowed then later divorced woman, then unhappily married woman, to begin a movement that launched the International Church of the Four Square Gospel. She was driven by such a love for God and compassion for people that she was willing to win the lost at any cost by any means. She prayed for the sick, she fed the hungry, she housed the homeless, and used every possible means to, to, to advance the gospel. She was criticized by the religious, but loved by the needy. She is a founder of the Church of the Four Square. And if God could take a woman that had been through marriages and divorce and all sorts of problems and illnesses and lost her husband to disease and as she was a missionary in China, if God can do that with her, he can do it with every one of us sitting here in this room today. May God do it again, I pray in Jesus' name. And then the post-World War II awakening. After World War II in 1947 and 1948, Pentecostals experienced two strands of awakening. One, the latter rain revival, and the other, the healing revival. And large numbers of evangelicals also experienced revival, resulting in many conversions. It was at this time that a great generation of Christian leaders emerged. Bill Bright began... Campus Crusade for Christ. In 1949, Billy Graham, you've heard of him. He exploded on the scene during his Los Angeles Crusades, sponsored by the Christian Businessmen's uh, Committee. An estimated 180 million people attended his 400 Crusades, and millions more viewed on television. And then college revivals broke out again as early as 1946, and when the prayer-based Wheaton College Revival of 1950 achieved national pub publicity, it sparked over, uh, over college revivals uh, throughout America. God did it before. May he do it again. Oh, God, do it in Western where Chloe's going to be going. May a rival be stirred up at Western Michigan University and, and U of M and, and Eastern Michigan. All our, God, may it happen again. And may our, may our Christian colleges catch the fire of the Holy Spirit and stand up and do something for God that is so needed. And then the Toronto blessing of 1994, and it's still going on. And I sadly confess, I joined Christianity Today and spoke against what I heard was coming from Toronto in the mid-90s. Some Christian leaders were enthusiastic about what they saw as renewal in North America Christian Christianity, while others thought it, saw it as historical and spiritually dangerous. I warned people not to be deceived by what I proudly considered excess. But then a burnout pastor came and preached. His name's Randy Clark. And revival broke out. He remained there preaching every night, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, week after week, until his wife called him and reminded him, you have a church here, you have a family here, you have a wife here, you need to come home. But what God was doing did not stop when Randy Clark went home. What followed 
Randy at Toronto stayed upon him when he went home. And it also remained in Toronto. And others like Bill Johnson and Roland and Heidi Baker and hundreds of others were visited by the Holy Spirit there. And when they went home, they carried what they got there to their ministries. And let me make a commercial right here. I think the group of leaders that are meeting with Pam and me once a month, the BAM Regional Leaders Group, is one of the most godly, on fire, exciting groups that I've ever been with. And every now and then they, they advertise things that are going on. Uh, in August, uh, Barbara Yoder is going to be at Napanee on a Friday night and, and at Janet Cook's Church, River of Life in Elkhart on, on Saturday. And I'll tell you, if you go to where God's moving, you'll bring the moving of God back with you and revival will break out wherever you are. End of commercial. In that first revival service in, in Toronto, there were about 120 people in attendance. And John Arnott stated that most members fell on the floor laughing, rolling, and carrying on. During the first year, the church's regular attendance size tripled to 1,000 members, and they were meeting. For years, they met every, every night until finally they decided to take uh, Mondays off so they could clean their homes and do laundry. In 1995... Cresma Magazine reported that an estimated 4,000 churches in England and another 7,000 churches in North America had been impacted by what God was doing at Toronto. During the same year, Steve Hill, an Assemblies of God evangelist who was powerfully intact, impacted when he attended Holy Trinity Brompton, which was also inspired by Toronto, and he was asked to preach at the Brownsville Assembly of God Church in Pensacola, Florida. Handful of members of, the, of this church had also been to the services in Toronto and had been praying for revival for several years. The Brownsville revival started on Father's Day and as a result reportedly led to almost a quarter of a million people being converted to Christianity. Do you want to see God work that way? Do you think he's limited to our size? Do you think he's limited to our budget? Do you think he's limited by your strength or by your age? I don't either. God, do it again. Number four, Pentecost releases an outward focus. Rather than remaining religious, Peter stepped out of his Jewish traditions and preached with an anointing that was not his own. And as we'll see at another time, about 3,000 people were converted that very day and added to the ecclesia. People did it before. And people can do it again. All the revivalists we mentioned look beyond the local church to release the things of God to the unsaved. Paul, once a proud and religious Pharisee, removed his cloaks of religiosity and did whatever it took to reach people for Jesus. He said, to the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak, I become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some." Or as it says in the voice, I've been broken, lost, depressed, oppressed, and weak that I might find favor and gain the weak. I'm flexible, adaptable, and able to do and be whatever is needed for all kinds of people so that in the end, I can use every means at disposal to offer them salvation. Amen. Number five, someone has to raise his or her voice. Beginning with Peter on the day of Pentecost, revivals have begun when individuals have broken out of their fallen character and dared to stand up, speak up, under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. This is the Hebrew year of the voice. Is it any wonder the devil is trying to mute our voices by closing churches and requiring everyone to wear a mask? Isn't that interesting? By the way, lest you worry... Our governor, educating powers that are not hers to have, has said beginning tomorrow that anybody in a, in a public place must wear a mask. She has no right to do that, but she's doing it. If you have an opportunity to sign the petition to revoke the executive powers that she has wrongly usurped from our country or our state, then sign those petitions. Don't worry if you sign them. 
There's three petitions going around. Sign all three of them. Sign them. Don't worry. If you sign them twice, they'll catch it. Sign those petitions. But even Governor Whitmore has said that, that there will be no penalties for people in churches that don't wear masks. Just want you to know that. I'm not against wearing masks. If you're led to, please do. And there needs to be no problem here. All we need to do is respect one another. Respect people with their right to wear a mask. Respect people with their right to not wear a mask. And, and for me, I've got my mask right here. If I'm Somewhere it's in this pocket. I'll put it on. If you have a mask on, I'll put it on. I don't want to give you my heebie-jeebies. But I believe what we've decreed, none of our people will get this. Peter stood up and he said, listen, I want you to understand. I want you to see what God is up to in this hour. Someone has to proclaim the good news in your house, your workplace, your school, and your neighborhood. People did it before and people must do it. We must do it again. Number six, someone has to quit following the crowd and choose to follow Christ. The crowd there was, was huge. Peter is named among the twelve, but he alone st chose to stand up that day and preach a sermon he had not prepared. This is the hour to be ready to instantly proclaim the word God is giving. Number seven, someone needs to speak what the Bible is saying about now, the time we're in. Number eight, someone has to pay attention to what God is speaking now. I love the voice translation of verse 17a. Hear what God says. Other versions say, says God, for God says, God declares. The point is, society is not changed by what people think or say. It is changed by speaking what God is speaking now. We have too many politicians, leaders, teachers, reporters, preachers, and businessmen getting rich by selling their souls to the devil. They who open their mouths and allow the lies of the devil to spew forth. We need trustworthy prophets who still declare the word of the Lord. Thank God we have some, and we need to listen to them, but... You may be the one called to speak God's word where you live and work. Will you? If you speak what God gives you to say, revival might break out through you. Let's pray. Father, I ask you to stir us up in your Holy Spirit to grasp the intensity of what you want to do in this age, the manifestation of your love, your power, your glory, your might, your wonders that will never cease. God, let us get a hold of the hem of Jesus' garment and not let go until we've pressed in to the way it's supposed to be instead of the way it is. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. We have time. I preached as fast as I could. I hope